Hello, this is my second attempt to record this presentation. Had some issues with data earlier. Uh, so yeah, just as a brief recap, a few things have happened. I got a call from uh, Ajay Academy uh, institution which teaches commerce, helps chartered accountants crack their exams. Uh, they asked me whether I could pop up and feature as faculty. And it was honestly not easy. I had less than two days to prepare and uh, show up and meet the person, Ms. Sushma, who runs the enterprise. And uh, I'll tell you what I did. I basically opened their uh, first chapter in the curriculum. And I think that it's on the foundations, or rather the classifications of different kinds of economies. And you have the usual um, division between socialism and capitalism, basically a uh, division between the extent of centralization that an economy implements. And I tried to introduce within such a framework, or rather within capitalism itself, some recent developments which have been taken into account by uh, certain fairly prominent economists, one being Yanis Varoufakis, the ex-finance minister of Greece, and to try and present how this uh, in many ways charts itself out within the kind of situation we are in, in India. And to help along the way, there's a small slideshow. I hope you can see it this time. And uh, it, this is to complement the presentation or rather whatever, the lecture or the class which uh, Ms. Sushma um, requested. So let me begin again. How do capitalist economies solve their central problems? Overview and objections. Um, planning in a capitalist economy, the absence of centralization. In a capitalist economy, which goods and services are to be produced and by whom are not charted out via a central command of the government. Uh, entrepreneurs and enterprises make largely independent decisions regarding which goods and services they would like to offer to the market. Now this is opposed to a socialist government which would in many ways organize industry along verticals that it would seek to establish for itself such as uh, let's say an emphasis in mining in one sector in one region or agriculture in another and so on. This does not mean that the government does not play a role even in a capitalist economy. Subsidies on um, key resources such as electricity, coal or land grants often enable stimuluses to industries which a government would like to encourage. The formation of special economic zones are such an example. Now uh, these are of course dependent on the kind of investment available for them because the government does not actually um, fund the industries in these zones it merely as it uh, tries to create conditions which are favorable for their development uh, and those are the subsidies that it offers for them as for the industries that actually take place in these areas these are often funded by private players entirely um, under favorable conditions uh, it parks uh, auxiliaries for aircrafts uh, other such equipment uh, you'll get a good list of it from uh, the website that uh, is provided by the government. And I think even I, I had a brief look at uh, uh, Noida Special Economic Zones website and they have 54 pro products and services which are listed. You can uh, browse at your own convenience, but this is not the focus of this presentation. So I'll go to the next slide. So how do enterprises decide what to produce? Reading the market. It is easy enough to say that a company offers its wares depending on consumer demand. The truth is no product is sold unless it is first offered in the market. And there is an awareness of it via, so, and there is a, an awareness of it via some form of advertisement. Um, for a startup, a decision such as this may be limited by an impetus felt to respond to local circumstances and the resources available for the enterprise. The other important consideration is 
for whom to produce for. And this is determined by the purchasing power of the customer. Now, of course, each company conducts its own affairs and there would be surveys that they conduct regarding how certain of their products are doing. Uh, they probably have tie-ups with people in stores which actually stock their wares that would actually inform them as to which products are moving, which are not. If they have, uh, let's say, certain tie-ups with banks when some customer chooses to uh, purchase their wares and when a certain uh, number of their stocks move, they might get an update from, uh, I don't know, their banking service provider. Presumably, I mean, those are possibilities. I'm not sure whether any of them have actually been implemented, but they have been thought about and uh, it wouldn't require very much um, organization beyond what is already in place to make it happen. This is something that uh, uh, another Swiss economist, someone named Christian Marazzi, talks about. And you can read his work if you feel like. Uh, however, I will go on with this slideshow. So capitalism, is it really decentralized? The role of money. For exchange to be possible, the economy cannot be completely decentralized, however. Every country has a central bank which issues currency, which acts as a medium of exchange, a measure and a store of value in a national economy. How this basic commodity is distributed and its worth vis-a-vis -vis other commodities plays a determining role in how companies conduct their affairs. Now, this is a seemingly self-evident truth in terms of any commercial matters. And uh, I guess without having to clarify very much, the questions which would be uh, up for debate is regarding the role of inflation, deflation, and what the supply of money has to do with this because these are circumstances that every enterprise would necessarily have to uh, face and the other question is how does the uh, value of money itself become uh, commiserable calculatable vis-a-vis -vis commodities services and also other currencies because this is something that the central bank would have to take in, into consideration when it decides to uh, print money at whatever denomination or magnitude. Money supply, fiat or backed against production. The central bank of a country can print money. In the case of India, this is the RBI or the Reserve Bank of India. Now, if a central institution can print currency, a commodity used as an intermediary between all others, on what basis does this institution decide how much currency to print? This is a question of liquidity in an economy. Printing more money will raise the price of commodities. This is known as inflation. The converse would also be true and is known as deflation. Uh, now, something that I was taking into consideration is that Given that this is a, an institute for chartered accountants, a number of people who would be showing up are people who would have done their 12th at least, studied ECO, and a lot of this might seem redundant to them. Yet since this was the first chapter in the curriculum, I thought, and since it does raise foundational issues, I think it's wise not to skip it. Also, keeping in mind that there would be people who wouldn't be coming from such a background. People would possibly be mid-career professionals moving in from another stream, uh, maybe someone who simply uh, didn't pick eco at the 12th, n number of possibilities. So it's always good to begin with something that is commonly groundable and uh, uh, can be built upon later. In some ways justifying my decision, but since we did begin here, I might as well continue. Um, what is the value of a currency? Is it backed by production or and trade? A currency is not pegged against the commodities and services. Oh, sorry. A currency is not only pegged against the commodities and services produced in a nation. It is also pegged against other currencies. Central banks try and position their own currencies vis-a-vis -vis others in a way which boosts trade and promotes incomes. 
stable pegs between two currencies allow for ease in trade. Now, uh, you will also find that there are certain um, situations where a manufacturer would have to, for example, draft a contract which ties batches of commodities or uh, batches of components uh, at fixed prices uh, to each other so as to be able to source them at a location and assembled. Now this often entails certain uh, relations between multiple components made in different places and at multiple currencies. Now the point of the contract is to freeze those exchange rates so that they can be traded at some degree of relative stability and this is required for any kind of uh, uh, manufacturing process which relies upon sourcing components which is more or less I mean like if you think about it almost all of our hardware almost uh, all of machinery heavy industry so on and so forth depends upon processes such as these But returning to the slide, what does this mean for the economy as per se? This effectively means that there is no economy which is completely decentralized. And in effect, we are under varying degrees of mixed economies. This can, of course, be changed. Reserve currencies, for example, in almost all central banks are held in dollars. Petroleum is traded in it and foreign exchange is usually calculated vis-a-vis -vis dollars. Now, this has to do with the the United States being the prime consumer market in the world, even now, and the fact that uh, uh, given that a lot of exports from more or less any country is aimed at the US market, or at least uh, premium products tend to be pitched there, uh, it helps for any manufacturer, producer, trader to be able to have in mind as ready, ready reference what the uh, present price of their commodity would be in dollars. Uh, because very often it's pitched to be sold there. Uh, I'm not very well attuned with the integrities regarding uh, how this actually helps in the trade relations, and that's something that I could perhaps uh, educate myself on. Maybe something for a later date. Uh, now, coming to the objections to the idea of capitalism as the present mode of production which we are in, um, we have the ex-finance minister of Greece from 2008 to 2012, presently a member of the European Parliament, Yanis Varoufakis, and his objection regarding the emergence of what he identifies as techno-feudalism. What does this mean? Does this mean that the prevailing consensus is that we are living under the conditions of capitalism, or are there any objections to this apart from socialism? which we will discuss maybe subsequently. Yanis Varoufakis, the ex-finance minister of Greece, suggests that we presently live under techno-feudalism, where an economy is driven by a central bank, by companies taking loans and using the credit to buy back their shares on the stock exchange, hence inflating the price of stocks. Now, this is really a dangerous situation. Uh, think of this, the uh, central bank would effectively have to, at some point, print currency. Old notes wear out, new ones are needed. Uh, commercial banks, which have accounts for private companies, would have to, or rather wouldn't have to, but are often in a position where it is profitable for their own upkeep to offer commercial enterprises loans. And these loans are used to set up industries, buy machinery, employ labor power, pay wages, maybe advance their own investments vis-a-vis -vis other enterprises, and so on and so forth. Now, if for whatever reason we reach a point where the loans which are drawn on by uh, private companies from commercial banks are used by the same companies to purchase a uh, stocks or investments which they may have a stake in in the stock market this would effectively allow them to inflate their own value uh, by the purchasing of stocks uh, hence increasing the price of the shares without actually producing or doing anything and this is something that did happen 
at least in Greece, for as much as we know. And it is unlikely that that was an isolated incident. And the extent of its uh, occurrence in other economies is presently not entirely unearthed or known to us. Yet, if you follow the argument that Varoufakis presents regarding techno-feudalism, uh, this is the outside of the argument. The inside is that uh, software companies such as um, Microsoft uh, and Apple, and this is the next slide, are effectively in a position to charge a rent merely for an existing customer to continually subscribe to their product. How does this happen? Think of a product almost all of us use, operating systems in our computers and cell phones. These softwares to be functional and compatible with others require to be updated on regular intervals. I mean like if you have an old enough version of Windows, it will simply not be compatible with the latest version of Word. Uh, there are other kinds of uh, issues that will pop up. Uh, I'm sure that, that you've had some problems with your web browser. If it doesn't update, there might be requirements or uh, the operating system to be updated before you can update the web browser and all such uh, compatibility issues. Anyway, uh, for these updates to be completed, we require to be paying subscribers to the companies that make such products. Effectively, tech companies, when in a position of monopoly, can command a rent for the products they offer on the market. This is no longer a capitalism which seeks to maximize per unit profits, but a techno-feudalism which extracts a rent to allow for the continued use of a product. And this is something that we will have to contend with. How we do so is perhaps still an open question. It has not been resolved. It would probably require some form of regulations. Uh, and this is the other role that the government does play, apart from stimuluses. It actually provides some forms of laws and regulations on how private players uh, conduct their enterprises. Now, this is not a long presentation, but I think it covers a few vital points that would hold anyone interested in these affairs, especially a chartered accountant who may be in a position to audit some of the uh, procedures in place in companies in good stead. Now, having said that, and this being basically a demonstration or an introductory class, uh, and having stumbled a bit in the beginning because, of course, my data issues with the laptop, I will call it a conclusion and say bye-bye to you and uh, have a good day.